All right, today is April 23rd, 2017. Today we have a very special guest, my friend Katerina Goitz, who is an Echo Parish Apprentice. So Katerina, the last time we talked was in college, our senior year of graduation. I wanted to talk to you about what you do in Houston, Texas as an Echo Parish Apprentice. Could you talk to us about what that position is? Yeah, so it's a pretty unique position. Um, because I'm studying theology at Notre Dame, but I'm also working in Texas, um, which is not near Notre Dame at all. But um, basically, I'm getting my master's and taking online classes through Notre Dame, and also I'll be there during the summers, and then I'm here getting experience. Because a lot of times when they say, you know, you need this many years of experience for a job, um, it's hard to get that. So this is kind of a program to help you get that, but also to have the master's behind you. Now, you didn't just apply for the program just to get ex any kind of experience. This ex experience is pretty specific to Notre Dame and also the realm of service. Could you talk to us with a little bit more detail what this kind of program entails doing? Yeah. Um, so basically, I, when I applied, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do in the future. I mean, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I did know that I was very interested in doing things, you know, and related to helping people with their faith. And so this program, I guess I got to work with people um, in the church in that way, but then also learn more about theology. Um, and so it's a two-year program through Notre Dame, and basically, and it's free too, which is really neat so that you don't have to pick, you know, I'll take this job because it pays a lot or this job because it doesn't because the master's is free. Yeah, so I've noticed that you serve a variety of capacities at the parish you work in, and I suppose that's part of the program at ECHO. Could you talk to us about what those different capacities are and how that blends in with the mission of the program? So. Basically, Echo is trying to give a little taste of everything that goes on in a church. So I'm involved in every area, like whether it's related to adults, um, kids, related to people who are not really, they're not Catholic yet, or people who are older and have been in the faith for a while. And so I guess in a way, it's to see what area you're interested in the most, so, so that afterwards, if you end up wanting to work in a church, then you could go towards that area. So. I work with um, middle, like middle school youth group. Um, I started a young adult group at our church. Um, I'll help with the catechists who are teaching the kids, like with formation with them. Um, I help with the school choir that's attached to our church. I work with the website, um, teach CCE class, and uh, which is um, basically Sunday school uh, for second graders, and also working with fourth graders in a similar way. And also helping with retreats for the kids when they're getting ready for First Communion or Reconciliation. Um, I'm trying to think. And I feel like there's always things that come up that end up becoming part of the job that you don't expect. Um, but, yes, yeah, just almost everything, I guess. Just Oh, and also writing for the bulletin. Um, write a little column each week about the gospel. So hearing about all of those different things you do, tells me that the role is pretty holistic in scope. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some specific tasks that you enjoy doing at the program? I would say I enjoy basically everything um, because almost everything is working with people and I like people. <laughs> and, and the things that aren't, like the bulletin, I feel like I'm still affecting people because hopefully they'll read it. Um, I especially like working with the kids because I guess seeing their growth um, is really exciting when you know they finally understand something, when I'm able to make a breakthrough with someone who wasn't very interested at first. Um, I think maybe one of the things that I like the best has been working with RCIA, which it's a process for people who aren't Catholic, but they want to become Catholic. Um, just seeing their growth and seeing how excited they were. They just were baptized this past Easter, um, the night before. So yeah, that's been really exciting. 
Could you share with us the link to the bulletin that you write for? Yeah, www.rcchouston.org. And the bulletin, I think it's a link at the top. Um, and then it gives you all the bulletins. You know, so that there's a lot more people reading the bulletin that you write for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they hand them out to everyone after Mass, but hopefully they also open them. <laughs> so this is kind of a interesting role that you're in because, you know, we went to a university that was pretty Catholic, I would say, and not all of the people there, despite being Catholic, were interested in working with a Catholic organization. They're pretty diverse in what they wanted to pursue. Could you talk to about how you identified your passion with your occupation as a person working in a volunteer organization that is Catholic? Yeah, so I did this program over the summer after my sophomore year called Notre Dame Vision. And basically what we did, I wouldn't say we were counselors. It was more like, it was a summer program and we were their small group leaders um, for high schoolers. And it was basically a conference where there'd be speakers talking about uh, different aspects of growing in your faith. And then we would kind of break down with the kids and, you know, build relationships and help them to learn more. And I just remember thinking to myself, I wish I could do this every day. It's so much fun. And then I realized, you know, that's, I mean, what job can you do that in? I don't know if that exists. And then that same summer, I heard about the ECHO program, and I realized, wow, this is something that I – I mean, it's not the same because you have to plan things. You know, someone else can't plan everything for you, but at least you can get to work with people and help them. And it's not – I guess when you do something that's exciting, it's not so much like a job that you have to wake up for. I mean, of course, when you're tired in the morning, you don't necessarily want to – Look up, but because you're going to work um, with people in that capacity, I really like that. And I guess these experiences come with doing a lot of service work, I suppose. Would you say so? Yeah, I would say. Um, because most of my breaks or summers, I did something related to service, like doing a summer service learning program um, or doing other things. And I guess. It brings me a lot of joy to be able to serve others, and if there's any way that I can apply that in my work, then I think that's really worth it. I wanted to get in specific detail with the service um, category of jobs people can pursue, uh, because it's so broad in what you can do. So how do you go about deciding which organization to align yourself with? Because I'm sure your skill sets were highly desirable in many other service organizations. It's kind of overwhelming at first because, I mean, Notre Dame had a service fair as part of the career fair. There was always, I would get these weekly emails with all these different opportunities. And there's just so many that sometimes it's like you don't even want to open it because there's just so many things to look at. But I guess when I chose to do Echo, it was partly in that I knew people who were doing it, and I really respected them. And I guess because they were doing it, it made me want to look into it more. But there were other programs I looked at that also, I mean, I didn't know anyone in them, but they also seemed neat. But I guess I think prayer has a lot to do with it because, I mean, you just to like know what is the feels the right thing to do, but also and also talking to other people. And saying, you know, what do you think about this? And then I guess I was trying to see what, what I don't know, I guess I'm, I make a lot of decisions based on feel. What is that uh, Myers-Briggs thing? Um, but I guess it's just thinking about what I'm interested in and then how that really aligned. And I'd also done things related to it in the past and, like, I had worked with Notre Dame's campus ministry with retreats or taught catechism class in a local church while I was at Notre Dame. And so I guess it was almost a natural progression, but at the same time it wasn't because I didn't study theology in undergrad. So I guess there's lots of options, and I don't know that any of them are necessarily bad when you go towards service as long as it's something that 
relates to something that you're interested in. And I guess I also spent a day or a weekend with uh, during the summer kind of seeing what Echo was all about and met some people in it and saw, you know, could I see myself there? I think that's a big thing in picking college or picking a service program is can I see myself there? And since I could, I felt like that was a really good reason. Katarina, could you talk to us about what you studied and how that might have aligned with your path to where you got here? Um, <laughs> I studied Chinese and business, so I don't know how much those actually applied. Um, I guess it showed me what I, well, I mean, I don't know. I might still end up doing something with them, but I realized there were other things that I was more interested in and that I wanted to study more in the future. Like I, I, at Notre Dame, we had to take two theology classes, but there was always more that interested me and I always wanted to learn more. So maybe it was almost the lack of it in a way, and then doing it in extracurricular things. So when I would think, you know, if I were to pick a, ch a job working in China with a business versus help, like working in a church, I guess I would choose the church first. Um, yeah, I guess it was just that it was more interesting. Um, I started finding that what I studied in college, it was interesting, but it wasn't the most interesting thing. Now that makes sense. Katarina, could you talk to about what some of your other options were? when you were in your first year or second year of university, to my understanding, in our last conversation, you had wanted to go into a completely different field. Yeah, I changed my mind a lot. And I mean, I'm still figuring out life. I mean, I don't know if you ever really do have things figured out, but I started out when I applied as a political science major and I wanted to go into international relations. And then as soon as I picked my classes, I thought, hey, maybe I should do business because I, I didn't really know much about business. So I thought I would do marketing. And then I realized that I didn't really like marketing. And then I thought, OK, I'll do entrepreneurship. That's really neat. And then I love my intro to accounting class. So I, I finally declared an accounting major my sophomore year. And then taking my, I guess, more advanced accounting classes junior year, I realized it just wasn't something that I was that interested in. And so I ended up becoming a Chinese major because um, I'd been taking Chinese classes the whole time and thought, wow, I'd really like this. But then also studied a lot of peace studies classes. Um, and so that's also another one of my interests, which I've kind of been able to connect in working in a church. Now, some of the audience members tuning in might be really afraid to go out and study something that ends up being completely different than their future job, what would you say to those people? Would you say in people who are deciding to study something or once they've already studied it? You know, once they've already studied it and they might be wanting to venture into compl something completely different than what they had already studied, in university, they've invested this month time and this amount of money, and they can't quite figure it out, but they want to gravitate towards something completely different. I would say that if you're going to stay in something just because you studied it, then that's also wasting time, unless it ends up being something that you want to do for your whole life. Because if I were to keep, you know, going with accounting, studying accounting, and then realizing that's not what I want to do, but keeping on with it because, you know, this is what I was interested in, then I would be, I mean, I would have time wasted. But also, I think there's a lot that I learned from what I studied in undergrad that even though I don't use it directly because my parish is mostly Spanish speaking, so I don't speak a lot of Chinese there, I still, I guess, use the things that I learned and I mean, there's always different skills, like with business. I guess I got kind of a bit of a business mindset and thinking about, you know, how the world works. And then with Chinese, you know, helping with language learning, but also with like working hard at mastering something um, and realizing that there's things that you can do that aren't necessarily easy, but it can work out. 
So I guess just kind of looking at the lessons that you've learned from it, just like in high school, I studied physics and I don't use physics at all, but there's a lot that I learned, like how to ask for help <laughs> with Tom. We're going to be talking about what your work-life balance is like as a corps member, if you will, of the ECHO program. So Katerina, give me a rundown of your day-to-day -day schedule as it pertains to your ECHO schedule. Every day is so different. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because there's some days when I'll go in at 7.45, some days I won't come in till noon. It just, it really depends. I guess I have to, so I work for 40 hours each week, which I would say is pretty standard in a job. Um, and then basically, because there's a lot of times events at nighttime, and so then I'll come in later in the day for that. So it's very flexible, but I would say during my day, it basically depends on what's going on that week, whether, you know, we're having a catechist training, then I'll be working on that, um, whether I'm giving a talk at youth group, then I might work on my talk, or one day I might work on my lesson for the kids. Um, a lot of my time, I'm also at things. so you know, participating in youth group or participating in seeing the Bible study. Um, also, every week I'll have a mentor meeting with um, my mentor. Kind of, I'll talk about, you know, what I'm doing that week and what's been my joys and what's been difficult and kind of ask her advice on things. And it's nice because she's been in it for a while, so she'll give me direction on that. So that's interesting because the local parish that I'm affiliated with is a little bit more structured. So would you say that the experience of a person working in at Echo or any volunteer program that's affiliated with the church depends on what kind of environment that the parish is operating in? I think definitely um, because there's, I think, 50 Echo apprentices or maybe 40 Echo apprentices right now. And every parish is so different. Even just, I live with three other people in the ECHO program, and just hearing their day-to-day -day experiences, they're all really different. And, you know, some people were all involved in different areas of our churches. And I guess, you know, one of my housemates comes and leaves, you know, usually he works nine to five every day, whereas mine's a lot different. It's, yeah, I guess kind of, it really depends. So you mentioned that you live with three other people, which is very suspect to hear. Could you talk to us about why you live with three other people? Yeah, so it's part of the program. And just like there's another program at Notre Dame called ACE, which is people who are studying to be teachers, where I think in a way it's to help us to kind of bounce ideas off of each other because we're all studying the same things and we're all working in different parishes and even though we have different experiences we are working in similar areas because I mean my uh, class that I'm teaching might be different than someone else's but they're both classes so um, and also so that we can learn about how to live in community um, so we I mean there's always you know, things that you can learn from other people and learning more about yourself, I guess, by living with other people. And we also will have a community night once a week where we're supposed to, you know. That's actually really nice because I find myself lonely a lot of times living alone. So that would be a really nice thing to have at my house. But uh, personal problems aside... <laughs> I have three automatic friends coming into a new city. I've never been to Texas before, but I already knew three people, and there was also um, seven other Echo people in Houston. So just knowing all of them, and because our program has been here for a while, there's people who knew the people who used to live in our house, and so they became our friends. So it's been kind of nice to not have to worry about making friends, although still making other friends too. Right. So while we're on the discussion of your three roommates, we're going to be talking about who your peers are, where they come from, what are they like, 
how are they similar to you, and what makes them good or terrible roommates and also coworkers. Yeah, do you mean the peers in the whole program or just in my community? Um, we'll start with the ones in your community because you live with them, and then we can expand that conversation to the entire uh, cohort. Yeah, so we don't actually work at the same parishes. Um, so I guess we're not coworkers, but we do do a lot of things together. Like I started a young adult group and one of my other room housemates did. And so we'll share ideas about that or try to do things together. And I would say every community is different, but ours has done really well. And we all like to do things together. Even when we don't have to be together, we still like to spend time and just talk. I think we spent a lot of time just talking about the most random things, which is great. <laughs> um, I would say everyone is pretty respectful, and and whenever there's something that comes up, we talk about it, and we've been pretty, pretty good about that, I think. Because I heard, I mean, Echo is really good about talking about everything that could go wrong, I guess, in a rooming situation, and you hear people from past years talk about what things you do need to talk about. And I think that because of that, we realize communication is really important so that little things don't become big. And I think it's been pretty good. I mean, there's always, I mean, I'm a, a little bit of a messy person, so I always have to work on being cleaner. <laughs> um, or just, you know, random lifestyle differences. But I think it's been really good. And they're all, they teach me so much because they they all studied theology in some degree when they were in undergrad. And so since I didn't, I have a lot that I learned from them that things I didn't think about before. Now, did all these people graduate from the same university? No, they're from all over. In the program in general, I would say the biggest group of people is usually from Notre Dame. But we only had eight my year, but the rest are from all over, like, with my housemates, for example, one's from Michigan State, one's from Dayton, one's from St. Mary's. So So I might have phrased this program as something exclusive to the university, but it turns out from what you're saying that is that the program is open to applicants from all universities? Yes. Yeah, it's for anyone. But it's originated from the University of Notre Dame, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess technically we all attend Notre Dame's grad school. So I guess we're all Notre Dame students, but you don't have to be originally from Notre Dame. Gotcha. Can we talk about what kind of people thrive in your position? And you can probably gauge this from the people, the coworkers that you work with, and also your roommates who are also people who have the same title as you. You should like people. <laughs> um because a lot of what working in a church is is working with people. I mean, there's also a lot of behind-the-scenes work where you have to plan things, um, but you're always going to be dealing with parishioners and parents and um, kids and whatnot. And I think also being flexible is really important because there's a lot of things that can change um, because, I mean, life isn't... You can't really control life, so different things in the parish will, you know, come up, like, you might not be expecting there's going to be a funeral, but you can't control that. I mean, your faith is obviously important, and because you have to share it in Echo. Wanting to serve, and wanting to just do whatever, and be open, because there's so many different areas that you can work with in Echo, and just being ready to fill in whenever someone needs help. Talk to us about the primary recipients of the service that you do. I mean, it would be different for each each person, but in mine, I would say that basically everyone that I work with, so when I work with the middle school choir, I'm helping them, or teaching in a CCE class, um, also with our young adult group, you know, trying to give the young adults a chance to not just be with older people. Um, and with the youth group trying to work with kids who are not always in the best place, but they're still trying to help them find their faith because they're still searching. So I guess 
basically whoever I'm working with in the particular situation because the church deals with people from every walk of life because there's babies getting baptized, there's kids getting their first communion, there's adults who want to enter the church or who want to be formed, um, or older people too who are looking for something to do. So it really sounds like you need a great balance of skills because what I was thinking was that if you had a primary recipient of service, then you can pretty much align your skill sets to working with just that target. But it sounds like you've got quite a batch of a number of people that you have to work with. So that entails kind of forming a broad skill set that kind of comes from experience in your formative years, I suppose, your middle school, high school, and in your college career? I would say that makes sense. Um, also, in the first year, we kind of do a little bit of everything, but in the second year, we go more specific. So after getting to work with all these different groups of people, picking what's my passion or what does the church most need. Um, so maybe for some people, will be they end up mostly working with the middle school and high school group. For me, I'm going to be working mostly with RCIA, so mostly with adults. Um, but yeah, I guess it depends. And you can say what you're interested in and what you want to work with the most. Some people even get to work with campus ministries. Um, my church isn't affiliated with a, um, a college campus, but some people in other places have. But I guess in the end, it's what the church needs the most because I think in anything in service, it's not so much what you want to do, but more what do people need? Because if you just do what you want to do, then that's not necessarily helping. (laughs) Unless it's also matching up with that area, but it should be a combination of the two. So just to get a little bit realistic with these types of jobs, which are, you know, very stressful and rigorous at times, any obvious downsides to your job or some that are not obvious? Yeah. Yeah. I would say when you're used some like some of my friends who have been in um, major leadership positions before Echo and then realize that they're not the one in charge now because, you know, they're just starting. It was a little bit difficult, um, but I think then they realize, you know, you just got to be open and like listening to other people's ideas. Um, or are there any particular fantasies about the job that you want to dispel? Um, you know, people have this great image of what service might be in their head. And when they actually do it, you know, they're sweating. They're smelling like they haven't showered in seven days. You know, stuff like that. I do get to shower, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but um, I would say a lot of times there's the fantasy that if I do Echo, I'm going to change all these people's lives and they're going to be completely different. But then you realize that you're not God, I guess. And so, for example, when I'm working with middle schoolers and some of them are really hard to reach, knowing that even if I don't make them have this huge change in their heart, at least those little changes, I think, it's it's realizing that you can't do everything, um, but you can at least work towards helping in some way um so realizing that you're not the savior but like i think that's a good thing because then it's not so much pressure um but just realizing that you know life is messy and so not everyone comes from the same place where you're working and some people will be more receptive and some people won't be but i guess just realizing that even making little changes is important because if lots of people make those little changes then that can really affect someone's life And at the end of the day, you know, in a greater theme, we're all individual cogs in a larger system. So it's a little bit unrealistic, maybe naive to say that one person can, you know, make a transformative change, especially when you're just coming out of college and you're doing service. Yeah, I think the temptation can sometimes be to think of some person, like some person in your life, like my youth minister was a big impact on my life but at the same time think also thinking that I could be that person for someone else but then I think back on it and I realize well she's not the only person who affected me it was also my parents it was also my friends so realizing that you're just one person 
but that you can still have a big impact for someone just in the way that you act. But realizing that, you know, a second grader might not remember everything that you told them, but they will remember how you treated them. I can't necessarily make everything change at once just because I try it, but at least working towards it, I think, is what works. Katerina, it's safe to say that this job is pretty specific in that it's not wildly popular, it's not very well publicized. For those that are interested in applying, um, could you talk to us about the formal pipeline uh, to applying for this position? Yeah, I would say that it ends up most of the people who find out are theology majors or people who are already thinking about something similar. But if you're not thinking about it already, it's definitely good to apply for. Basically, I'm trying to remember. It was there's a written application, which is pretty long, but I think that's a good thing. Where because, can people find this? Oh, it's on the website echo.nd.edu. And there's a written application and you need letters of reference. And then you also have to take the GRE. And um, once you submit your application, they look over it. And if they choose to bring you to the next round, then they'll take bring you to Notre Dame for an interview. Unless you already go to Notre Dame, then you're already there for the interview. And then they make their final decisions. But I think something I realized is that there, the questions aren't just, you know, why do you want to study theology? But it's also, you know, what's, you know, very personal things like, what's your journey here? What's easy or difficult for you? Because they want to know, I guess, about the whole person, because they really pray a lot about the decision that they make on who to take on. And also, I guess they want to see how you would live in community, just when they're, to match up the communities and see if it's the right fit for you. But just seeing, you know, what kind of person are you when you're living with other people? And just kind of getting the whole picture. One of my friends, um, the year before I applied, said that basically they ask you everything in your life so that once you finish, you realize you can't think that you forgot something because you said everything, which I don't know if I would go that far, but there's, there's still a lot of things that you say on it. And, and by GRE, you mean the graduate, uh, I forget the exact name, but it's like a tests that you take for graduate school yeah Mm -hmm. and you need a a certain score I don't remember what the score is but it's on the website and if it doesn't work you can you can retake it too and the idea behind this examination is that part of the program is the fact that you're studying for a master's in theology yeah they want to make sure that you're ready and that you know you're not going to be having a really difficult time with it because during the summer, it's very intensive. You can take four or five classes, which are all three credits. And it's basically three credits and three weeks. So everyday class, which is good because then you have the time during the year to be able to work in a parish, but it's, it's very intense in the summer, but also it's great in the summer because we get to be with everyone else in the program who ends up being all over and, they're amazing people. I mean, people that I would, an undergrad would have been like my closest friends, but there's so many of them. <laughs> so could you remind us once again, the, the structure of the program, it's two years and there's a labor component to it. And there's also an educational component to it. Um, in your words, summarize sort of the two year schedule. You come for the first summer and you take your classes at Notre Dame. And then during the academic year, you go down to wherever your site is and work there and then come back the next summer for about two months again and then go work again for another year. And then the last summer is when it's the final project, um, final, you know, seeing if you pass for your master's, which I think everyone in Echo has passed so far. So that's a relief to hear. Nice. And the prerequisites for the program is? You have to have graduated university by the time you hear back, I suppose, from this program. And you also have to take the uh, graduate school exam. Yeah, I was still in college when I applied. So I guess it's just before the program starts to finish. 
but also you need to take six credits of theology. Um, and whether for a lot of people, they'll take it while they're in school, but some people didn't study it in school. So they'll take, there's these online um, classes. I think it's the step program through Notre Dame that you can also get credits through. Great. So that covers the pipeline to getting the job. And we've pretty much covered everything. Oh, wait, can I say one other thing? Yeah, sure, go on. Uh, also, so I'm doing the parish part of ECHO, but there's also a theology teacher's track, which I'm not in, but that's um, basically we all do the same studying in the summer, working the school year, but they work at a Catholic school teaching theology instead. Excellent. Katerina, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Some of the audience tuning in will identify their passion with your occupation and pursue that as a goal, perhaps even try to join the ECHO organization. And that's always a great feeling to be having. Now, if you could give one final message to those people who want to become an ECHO parish apprentice or maybe someone working in the church or a volunteer organization in general, what would that final message be? When I was looking at ECHO, I said, I'm not sure what I want to do. I don't know if I want to work in a church. I don't know if I want to do campus ministry or community or um, working with an NGO. And they said, perfect, apply. And so I think doing ECHO or any other kind of service, it's just a great opportunity to learn more about yourself and also about that area of service. Um, so I'm learning about if I want to work in a church, but in any service organization, you're learning more about that. And I would say just go for it and try it because it's been a really great experience. Now, for the Chinese audience tuning in, Katarina has studied Chinese, so we're going to be leveraging her major. So that in Chinese is... Okay, whatever she said, I second. Thank you, Katarina. Talk to you soon.